Shirley, are you ready to read the scripture? I'm, I'm ready. Okay, would you read the scripture for us? <clears throat> it's John 19, then the same, day, or 2019. Um, then the same day at evening, beginning the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12 and not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless to I, I'm sorry. You're good. Okay. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with, with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Shirley. Will you all pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have to begin with a confession this morning. And that confession is that um, sometimes it's challenging to find something to say about a passage that literally comes up every year. But also it's always um, challenging to preach the Sunday after Easter. What do you preach the Sunday after the best sermons are given? That the best sermon that was ever given was given, right? Jesus alive. And it's also challenging for pastors to keep, keep coming up with new ideas. And so I'm gonna to admit to you this morning that I am preaching most of a sermon I've already preached even to you guys. But I think it, I think it has something to say to today's circumstance and to, to our context of this moment, of these moments. And so I thought, let's do it again. Let's hear these stories again and with some fresh interpretation, but I just want you to know that if it sounds familiar, it's because you've heard it before. So in times gone by, one of the main means of travel was a stagecoach. Now stagecoaches were sort of the opposite of social distancing because if it was full of people, you were all scrunched in there together. But even in the West, even in these scrunched up circumstances, Humans being humans figured out a class system for tickets, meaning that most of the journey, even though in most of the journey, you would not have experienced a difference in the trip, right? Still scrunched up with somebody else, still, still next to that person who doesn't smell very good and next to that guy who didn't clean up after he got out of the, the, the um, gold fields and is still dusty and, and gross. But but you could there, there, there you would have a, a first class ticket, a second class ticket, or a third class ticket, even so. 
And, and you wouldn't know there was any difference in these class tickets, except they were sort of insurance on what you had to do if there was a problem with the stagecoach. Now, when there was an issue in the trip, the distinction of which kind of ticket you bought would become evident. Because if you had a first class ticket, you could remain in your seat while they had to change the wheel or fix it or reband it or whatever they had to do. And if you were a second class passenger, you had to get out of the coach and stay out of the way. So you had to get up and, and um, go sit on a rock, even if it was raining, even if it was, it was snowy, you had to get out of the coach because they, somebody needed to make it lighter, right? And if you had a third class ticket, you can guess what you had to do, right? If you had a third class ticket, then you had to get out of the coach and help in whatever way you could. Repairing, maybe lifting, maybe searching for rocks to put under the slippery, whatever, right? You had to get out and help. Now, this morning, we have a story, you're thinking to yourself, what does a stagecoach have to do with the story of the upper room, of the disciples anxious and cowering in the, in the um, upper room, waiting for what might be to happen next? Um, and I think that the, our story this morning, this story reminds, the ticketing system is that the reality is, is that in this upper room, in this appearance by Jesus among them, of his, of his continuing appearance among them, reminds, uh, they discover just what kind of ticket they had for the next part of their journey, of their journey with God and their journey with Jesus. They aren't going to be able to sit back and rest in the coach. It's not that kind of ticket. It's not all the leg room you could imagine. Nope, that's not what they're getting. And they're not even gonna be able to be mere observers of the history unfolding before them. The disciples, soon to be the apostles, the sent ones have to have feet on the ground help in whatever way you can, get down and risk it getting dirty for the kingdom of God express. One could argue that they have had first and second class tickets until this moment. They've been along for the ride, witnessing to the work of Jesus, mostly staying out of the way. There are a few times when they're, they've been They've been issued those third class tickets. Go out and heal people. Go out and, and, and spread the word. But our scene today in that locked upper room where they're hiding in fear, where they are wondering what is next for them with some trepidation, Jesus gives them their new tickets, third class tickets. You know, we have some baggage, wouldn't you say, around those kinds of words? They, but, but I don't think it's a worse level of ticket. It's just a different kind of ticket. It's just a different way of operating in the world. And isn't that what being a follower of Jesus Christ is about? Isn't it about figuring out how it is we are to be God's people, how we are to be the body of Christ in the world? And we can't do any of that by sitting on the sidelines or thinking we've got it all figured out. We're not just along for the ride. The disciples aren't just along for the ride. They and us are going to be in the middle of the midst of the hard work of creating the kingdom of God. This group of disciples has gathered in as safe as place as they could imagine. They have been through the ringer. Their minds and their bodies are overloaded. I think we understand what that feels like, right? This, this season that we have had where we are not allowed to be in the presence of all of those who make our lives full. 
we are we are in the same place we're in the midst of of being overwhelmed and confused and fearful just as those disciples were in this passage the greek word used for fear is phobon and maybe you you hear another word you know in phobon phobia it's that's where our english word for that for phobia comes from phobon is is a sense of a fear of, of a irrational and unthinking kind the kind that means that you you feel emotionally terrorized afraid of your own shadow monsters around every corner and they didn't even dare look under their beds this fear, of course, was not ir exactly irrational in that first century or unthinking. Their world had been turned upside down and inside out. We know something of an upside down turned world and an inside out world, don't we? We have left all that is familiar just as the disciples had they left families, jobs, lives, livelihoods to follow Jesus. We've lost, we've left some of those things too. Just to be disciples, just to be good citizens, just to be alive. It's whiplash, right? If we're not going in that direction, what direction are we going in? Where are we going to? do what are we going to do now it would be easy i think Good, thank and it you. wouldn't have been such a bad idea i don't think if those disciples had decided to just return to normal had just decided that this third class ticket was not for them that they wanted to live differently they wanted to live like everybody else. And so they just went home. They went back to fishing. They go back to, to, to being shepherds. They go back to viewing the things they have been doing, they had been doing. But you know what? Just when the followers of Jesus thought that they were at the end of a dream, that they are have lost the thing that they thought was going to save them, just when they were, you know, where are, are we going to stay or are we going to go? Jesus enters in. Jesus enters in as they are grieving what was and, and are grieving what could have been, just as they are adjusting to a new reality. It's just the beginning of the new reality, but they're beginning to understand that that's where they are. And, and Jesus comes in through locked door and all with gifts for the coming journey with their third class tickets, their get out and help tickets. I think that's where Jesus is with us these days. We, we have been challenged in the last few weeks about exactly what it means to be church, exactly what it means to be family, exactly what it means to be the people that God calls us to be. We understand what it means to feel like we are upside down and turned around. And Jesus is entering in coming through all the locked doors we have put up, the physical ones and the emotional ones and the spiritual ones. And he comes not to enter our phobon with us, not to enter our fear with us, but to come to meet our fear with four simple words, peace be with you. And it's not just shalom, like hello. And it's not just like peace with like the absence of war. But the words used here mean completeness, welfare, and health. 
a state in which everything is as it should be and harmonized relationships between God and humanity. God comes in the middle of turmoil and anxiety and to these incomplete folks, folks like us who are still not done, still not perfect, still trying. People like us who need a little resurrection hope. This peace is not tied or dependent on external circumstances. It is mysterious and it is the still point in chaos. Peace not linked to how well you're doing your job or how well you're getting along with your family or how much money you have in your savings account or how well your retirement fund is doing in the stock market, which couldn't be very, very scary. The peace that this is a peace that descends in rolling waves, rolling waves in the midst of our grief and anxiety, resurrection hope. Look at the story. The resurrection hope comes first for those close friends and followers, and even they receive the news differently. In John's telling of the resurrection, Mary is the first to see Jesus, then the disciples in the locked room, and then a whole week later, Thomas. The way that these people move from grief to hope is as different for each of these people as it is for us. Mary attuned to the voice of God, ready to testify to resurrection. The disciples navigating fear and belief and joy and isolation all at one time. And Thomas, who hasn't yet had a, a witness to the, the resurrection hope until he experiences it himself. Thomas isn't demand, um, doubting in these moments, but demanding that Jesus show up for him to experience with his whole being what that resurrection hope will be. Mary, the disciples, or Thomas, or any of the other ways that we move through grief are all part of this peace process, of the waves of, of resurrection hope that God sends us. The waves that come upon us in, in expected ways and unexpected ways. That come upon us as we sit in our living rooms for the longest time and as we step carefully and thoughtfully into the world. Thanks be to God that no matter the wrenching chaos of the world and no matter where or how or even if we mark the day, Easter happens. Life flourishes in the face of death and we are often offered resurrection hope. Thanks be to God. Amen.